Good afternoon, uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you on behalf of both of us for the wonderful uh, welcome. And um, I, uh, we had a quick chat before, but we decided that this was going to be a relaxing session, particularly um, as what uh, the, the, the level of tension on the, in the previous session, which, by the way, is, of course, an important and an ongoing discussion that needs to be had. But hey, let's now coast towards the end, particularly towards the exciting poetry and other fun we're going to be having later in the evening. Uh, now, um, so we're going to have a chat, and we're going to talk about uh, Pan-Africanism. You've been introduced already. I don't need to introduce you. But I'm going to start off with a question that's a little bit uh, more personal. And it's also personal because uh, it's me uh, using you to get a little bit of revenge. And I I'll explain myself. Um, one of the questions that occasionally when I get interviewed, I get asked most uh, is a question that the first time it was posed to me, I, I wasn't even sure how to answer. The second time, ah, I was ready for them, but I thought, why do they ask me this question? Third, fourth time, and so on. I thought, okay, this question is going to crop up all the time. I'll, I'll live with it. I think you can probably guess where I'm going. It's a question that I am now getting my revenge. For the first time ever, I'm asking somebody, what's it like being, having a father like Kwame Nkrumah? Okay. Okay, and I make no apologies. I know it's a horrible question, but no. hey, I'm getting my, my revenge. No, it's <laughs> not. <laughs> but, but before we start, I, I want to thank the people and the government of Kaduna State for having me here. For the first time, I'm visiting this beautiful state and this beautiful city. So thank you. Thank you also to Kaba Fest and all the organizers. Um, I've enjoyed the Hausa um, session, listening to Hausa, which is not far from Arabic, which I speak fluently, and, and also the session on feminism. As a staunch feminist, I enjoyed the debate. Yeah? So, um, so I'm happy to be here for, with you. Tired or not, I think it's, um, I'm so happy I made it. Now, to the question. For me, it's, um, it's a great honor. Uh, it's really a privilege to be associated in any way with the great Pan-Africanists, or Sajifo, as we call him, out of respect, Kwame Nkrumah. For me, he's not a father as much as he's a mentor and a teacher. So I, I'm so honored to have anything to do with him, including being his humble daughter. And I, yes, I always say that I'm an Nkrumahist by conviction, more than by birth, truly by conviction. And I'm happy we are in this setting, we are talking about books and writers, because actually what made me an Nkrumahist is reading Kwame Nkrumah's books, and he wrote no less than 14 books. A lot of people don't know that. And some of his books are still very, very relevant. Um, the one particular book is a book that made me change my life completely, because I, I can say I'm, I was a diaspora. I had, I had lived outside my country for about th three decades. Can you imagine? Yes. But reading Kwame Nkrumah's Africa Must Unite for maybe the third or fourth time made me decide, no, I'm packing up, changing my life, I'm going back home. Because the ideas in that book must be lived, must be demonstrated. They are not just enough to be talked about, but we have to live them. So I believe in the power of words. So I'm happy to be in the company with thinkers and writers. Kwame Nkrumah was a writer and a maker of history, I would say, because he wrote from a position of experience, of knowledge. He was an organizer and an intellectual, too, um, and a thinker. So that question is a big one. But honestly, um, he's not my father. He's my leader. Fantastic. 
Uh, and of course, my hidden agenda was that I knew she was going to answer, it, answer that question better than I have ever answered it. But now I have the formula. Thank you very much. Next time I'm asked it. So now, um, I think Lola hinted that um, I was going to take you to task. I'm not going to take you to task, but I did make a comment uh, uh, to Lola when we were discussing this that I felt that the Kwame Nkrumah brand of Pan-Africanism was a bit idealistic. Now, you currently run you, the, your organization. Uh, I'm not going to say the name, but please, please, please do. I don't want to get it wrong. But basically, it's to promote uh, Pan-Africanism and, of course, Kwame Nkrumah's ideas. Are you promoting the same brand, or are there critical things which have now been adjusted, maybe things that I, uh, some of those things that I think uh, were a bit idealistic, but kind of in defining your brand of Pan-Africanism, Pan that's probably the best way to start with that. Um, okay, um, but I want to start with uh, one anecdote from our story, our family story, before I go on. Because um, as some of you might know, um, our mother is not a Ghanaian, she's an Egyptian. So she's an African, but not a Ghanaian. And uh, the story of this uh, political, I should say, marriage, Pan-African marriage, is quite interesting. So the circumstances of my birth have helped me understand better why and how we can unite uh, as a people. Now, and this story was told, mother, was told to me by mother. Now, we are talking about 57, long, long time ago. Mm? Kwame Nkrumah, who, who was Ghana's prime minister at the time, decides to get married. But he decides he wants to marry a woman from North Africa. His friendship with another African leader, Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt, the president of Egypt at the time, somehow gave him the idea that, yes, that's a good place to look for a suitable wife. <laughs> so he sends some, um, and, and, and uh, let's say, emissaries to go and look for a suitable Egyptian wife for him. They, they go, they meet different families, and finally, they stumble across my mother's family, and for the first time, because one of the problems they had is that all the families were terrified by the idea of their daughter going to some faraway country in Africa called Ghana, which nobody or very few people had heard of. Anyway, they were moving around with press uh, cuttings, clippings, so they give the family this information, and our mother, who I consider she must have had a revolutionary mind because she's, she was the only one of her sisters who said, yes, I would like to meet this man. He's, he's a revolutionary. Look at what he's done. I would also like to meet Gamal Abdel Nasser, the then president of Egypt. And um, so by all means, let us organize this meeting. Now, Kwame Nkrumah's Ghanaian emissaries were for the first time so relieved that they said, finally, we found a girl who's willing. But the, the family would not budge. So they had to seek the help of Egypt's president at the time. They said, if you don't intervene, nothing is going to happen. And indeed, Gamal Abdel Nasser called the family, and he said, do we know who we are talking about? We are talking about the most important African leader. We are working together on different fronts, non-aligned movement, on the, uh, we, we are trying to see how we are going to set up an institution to guide us to unity, the, the organization of African unity, which is today the African Union. So we are working on many fronts, how to help liberation movements and other countries gain independence. So we cannot say no to this man. We must organize that meeting. And we are going to do so in a very low key manner. Your daughter will go to, to Ghana, meet this man,
and then she returns. So at least we would have done our side of the bargain. And to reassure the family further, Egypt will open an embassy. <laughs> so that was the beginning of full diplomatic relations. Mother travels with her uncle to, to Ghana and with the, 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 the new embassy staff, Ghanaian, to, to, to Accra. And mother said, the moment she saw this man who was, who was waiting for them at the airport, she said, yes. He was the most charming man she had ever seen. Mind you, yes, <laughs> these two had, had never met. They had never met before. So it, this was an arranged marriage. They sit together. Mind you, they don't speak the same language. At the time, mother spoke French, uh, yes, French and Arabic, of course, but she went to a school which the second language was French. And at that time, our father spoke English and, of course, our local Ghanaian languages. No French, no Arabic. So they sit with interpreters and then with dictionaries, with dictionaries. And I tell you, I kid you not, at the end of two hours, those two had decided they would get married. And they got married that day and mother never left. <laughs> So, so it's destiny, I guess. That's destiny. That's the way it is. But the, what I get from this story, apart from, of course, the power of love and destiny and all that, is that when we make up our minds to do something, nothing can stop us. You know, not the differences in languages, not the differences in religions, not the difference in culture. And our continent is so diverse. I mean, look at your great country alone. I mean, you cannot have anything um, different. You know, so many different ethnic groups, but you've come together, you accepted, you made a decision to be politically united. So the key word here is politian. Many of our problems are political. Um, now, back to our question. Now, Pan-Africanism, as Kwame Nkrumah defined it, was the total liberation and unification of Africa. And he defined it as an objective that we seek to reach an objective, total unit freedom and unity. Now, I don't think if Kwame Nkrumah had not gone and worked with Pan-African intellectuals, I think Ghana's, uh, in, the, in the United States of America, who were fighting for, um, um, against segregation and discrimination, you know. He met with these people, he thought with them, he organized with them. So Pan-Africanism as an idea was born outside Africa. And that's why his famous saying, I'm not an African because I was born in Africa, but I'm an African because Africa was born in me. Mm -hmm. That is where the origins of that statement, that we make up our mind that we want to unite for a purpose. We don't decide to unite because we look alike, or we speak the same language, or we do things the same way. Even though, even though there is a sense of common experience most Africans have. Um, I grew up in Egypt partly and partly in Ghana, and the cultures are so different. But I know that our countries are grappling with similar things. One of our biggest problems is that the model of economic development we have is not working for the majority. What am I saying? I'm saying that we are not productive enough. And I want to give you one example. You know, Ghana's, we are great cocoa producers. 
as is the Ivory Coast. And here a little too, um, not a little, I mean, you're a big country, but so I'm sure a lot. Now, annually, the value, the value of cocoa beans annually is for all, everyone, all producers, is about $10 billion. Now, the market value of the added, the value added cocoa products, not the raw beans, uh, like whatever, whether it's the butter, it's a chocolate, it's everything you can produce from cocoa. Annually, it's a hundred billion. Can you see the difference from 10 to a hundred billion? Now, it is obvious that we, the producers of just that one um, product, if we focus on adding value as nations to our raw material, just that one, look at how much more we will be making. And we'll be in much more control because as an economic model must change. But it can change easily if we don't unite politically and economically. The huge product, uh, projects, rather, developmental projects we need to do, one of them is a very good example, the Inga Dam in the, the Congo, one of the biggest and richest countries on our continent. It needs to be done. For the past 50 years, Kwame Nkrumah first talked about it in his book, Africa Must Unite. And in some of our AU conferences, we, we bring it up. Yes, we need to construct the Inga Dam in the Congo. But you know what? Not a single country can construct it on its, on its own. You know, dams are so expensive. We know in Ghana how much our big um, uh, dam, Akosombo Dam in the east of the country cost us. So the only way to do huge developmental projects is what? Is for us to integrate our economies. The, the Sahara Desert, that beautiful, beautiful piece of land in the middle of our continent that could produce renewable energy, water bodies, it could become green with vegetation. But none of our countries can tackle it on its own. So what am I saying? For us to eradicate poverty, for us to gain control of our resources, of our economies, we have to find a way of becoming productive. And it's for us to integrate our economies. But even a decision as having a common currency. Don't you think that that is ultimately a political decision? Can you have a common currency without decision makers sitting together and agreeing to do it? Are we going to do away with our borders without our decision makers agreeing to do it and how to do it? So all these serious economic decisions that impact on our economies are political decisions. So back to Kwame Nkrumah's call for unity. He said, we must have political and economic integration. And if I want to be honest with myself, we haven't come up with another or better proposal. So why do we need to change or reform or amend a proposal that we have not yet even tried to implement. So the Pan-Africanism of 50 years ago is the Pan-Africanism of today. And if the greatest thing that happened to us in the last century as Africans, the greatest thing that happened to us was what? Was for us to gain our independence, so that we can start making decisions that will be in the interest of our people, not anyone else. Now, 
the biggest, best thing that happened to us in the last century was to gain independence. This century, the biggest thing that could happen to us as Africans is for us to gain control of our economies, our resources, our land. Because if you don't control your land, if you don't feed yourself, where is your dignity? Where is our dignity? If we cannot feed ourselves, where is our dignity? So the biggest thing that could happen to us, and this is especially for the younger generation, because this is your mission. Franz Fanon said every generation has what? Its own mission to accomplish. Now, the biggest thing that could happen to us is for us to gain control, full control of our resources and our land. But that cannot happen if we work separately and individually as small states. It honestly cannot happen. That is why our politicians are struggling, our decision makers are struggling. We can have the best intention, but we simply can't deliver. Small Ghana, whose annual GDP is 50 billion, 50 billion, cannot negotiate fairly with countries whose annual, bill, um, uh, annual GDPs are in the trillions. Japan, EU, uh, China, the, U the USA, you are talking about trillions. So how can you negotiate fairly? It is simply unrealistic. So the only recourse for us is unity. We will go round and round in circles until we come to that conclusion. And it is your decision, popular determination. It's a people's decision. You can push and compel your leaders to go in a certain direction. That is what happened with independence. The people embraced it, and our leaders took it up. Uh, so. It can be done again. And uh, now I've forgotten I'm speaking too much. I want you to ask <laughs> no, me questions. I've got plenty. I will, I will no, I, I, frankly, I, I was ready to just say thank Please. you and, and move on, uh, <laughs> no, move no, on no. at the end of no. the hour. But no, no I mean, uh, I'm, 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 OK, let, let me say you've reduced my uh, level Work. of cynicism. But now we need to talk um, a little bit about some one or two barriers. Um, but first, I hope that message has really sunk in. In other words, we, as the uh, citizens of Africa, we need to begin to think of this as one of the solutions to some of the many things that have been talked about um, here today. In other words, this is not some highfalutin discussion, but this is something that ultimately rests on, on our shoulders. Now, you've said political and economic union, and of course you've pointed directly to the key uh, intermediaries who will make this happen, the politicians. The politicians who should already have us very far along this road would have been the OAA, the members of the, the those who you know run, ran and were members of the OAU, or at least who attended the meetings, were all the members, and then now uh, the African Union. Do you see any time soon them getting either the political will, or more importantly, the technical ability, these are complex. You mentioned just the, the, the simple, oh, supposedly simple, the single act of having a single currency. Now, I'm not an uh, economist, but well, I, I witnessed the attempts um, to get the European Union you know, growing before all this Brexit stuff happened. But one of the biggest problems was getting their economies aligned, which in itself was a whole, you know, a whole task. Do our politicians have the technical capability to actually make this happen? OK, um, the problem with the European unity is that it started by economic unity. They started focusing on how to integrate their economies. But that's exactly what you are, we are saying. That is a very complicated route, but particularly for us, because we are poorer and we are struggling. Mm? These are big industrialized countries, so it's even easier for them. So we are saying that you cannot start just discussing the economy. You will never agree. 
our economies are so different, you know, some big countries, some small countries. But there has to be first a common purpose, common planning. And that can only begin if we agree to unite politically. And I want to tell you that it's not so impossible. Because if you look at, by the way, we were not this one nation. We were four different territories. You know, we had Northern Ghana, uh, we had the Ashanti region, we had the, what we, we used to call the British Togoland. They even, we even had to go through a plebiscite or referendum for that eastern part of the country to agree to join us. And then we had the coastal areas, you know, like uh, Accra and, um, and the, the other, um, and, and central, what is central region today. So we were not, we were not one nation, but we decided, we made a decision that we are going to be one nation and we are going to call it Ghana. That is a political decision, a political decision by the people. The people of Africa must decide. And I thank God that we are in the company of thinkers and writers, you know? Sometimes we call you our intellectuals, hmm? our thinkers. Everything happens on that level in the first stage. Before every, I think it's the same Kwame Nkrumah who, sa um, Kwame Nkrumah who said in one of his books, Conscientism, that before or standing behind Every social revolution is an intellectual revolution. Mm? So it is our consciousness, the change in our consciousness, the determination in our thinking and our minds that somehow leads us in a certain direction. So the intellectuals, if they accept an idea, our writers, our thinkers, our academics, our artists, our um, performers, if we accept an idea and we push it, then popular determination will follow. So can I then ask about the popular level now? So we're talking about moving the politicians along the scale. Yes. Do we have that level of unity now? Where I'm going, of course, is the, what has been happening in South Africa. We Can you now speak to that and answer that question, whether we, as the population of the countries, yes. are ready to embrace our no, brothers and sisters? We obviously don't. And this is, th we, we do not. We have to admit it to ourselves that we do not. Uh, um, Pan-Africanism is not in our discourse. We don't talk about it in schools. We don't, we don't even have university degrees in Pan-Africanism, or maybe one or two countries. But I do, we'd not, we, we are really not paying attention to that. And in doing so, we are failing to understand that most of our countries gained independence, including, of course, South Africa, as you know, because many African countries decided to help and support liberation movements. In 1958, one year after Ghana became independent, we had two important conferences. The All African independent states conferences. There were only eight or seven independent states who met, but they said, we are going to help all other countries who are not independent to become independent. Then in that same year, we had the, which was a more important conference, we had the All African Peoples Conference. All African Peoples. So, Everybody, civil society, women's groups, trade unionists, different organizations, including liberation movements, came and a decision was made. We are going to help each other so that countries which are still under colonialism will be supported. And that is how training camps were given 
were, were set up in Ghana for the freedom fighters. This is how some, especially so from Southern Africa, were given um, Ghanaian passports so that they can leave their countries to campaign for education, to solicit resources. So what I'm saying is the reason many of our countries became independent is because we adopted a pan-African approach. And this is what we need to consider today, our generation. Are we thinking with a pan-African perspective? Are we? I don't think we are. I don't, I don't know. I don't think we are. But that is the missing piece in our puzzle. The, in our struggle, that is a missing piece. And I want us to reintroduce Pan-Africanism in our discourse, in our politics, you know, in our activism. We need to bring it to the table and un embrace it, understand it. And it's the people who are going to put pressure on politicians and leaders. Okay, so um, another potential, uh, not maybe a barrier, but, and it's very pertinent to you, I'm sure you have some interesting insights in this. Africa, when we look at it and when we talk about Africa, we know there's, maybe we call it the elephant in the room, the issue of sub-Saharan Africa, Northern Africa. You actually embody both, genetically <laughs> speaking. Um, do you think when we think about Pan-Africanism, we are talking about Sub-Saharan Africa, or should we be aiming for Africa as a whole? Yes. Uh, again, I don't know. I don't know about you, but I don't want to, I don't want the Sahara to be divided into half, you know? I don't want to lose an inch of our continent, because as 1.2 billion people, and if you add the diaspora, by the way, because pa the Pan-Africanism, the concept includes Africans outside the continent, in North America, Australia, uh, Brazil, you name it. Also, many of us who've gone out of our continent in search of greener pastures or, you know, so the diaspora is every single African outside the continent. Like Marcus Garvey said, Africans abroad and Africans at home. So now if you add them to, which we should, we are talking about 1.5 billion people. 1.5 billion people. Now can you imagine if we are planning together, planning economically, if we are thinking together, who is going to undermine us? What is it that we will not be able to do, 1.5 million Africans? And we are not talking about losing our sovereignties. I understand the problems of federalism. I mean, you, perhaps your country, your nation understands it better than many of us. But one of the best ways of having this union is under federation. So states are not going to lose their sovereignties completely. But in certain aspects, the economy and planning the economy and big industrial projects, foreign affairs and defense, having a common or um, Pan-African military command. In these three areas, we have to have a collective African decision. But in so many other things, every country has its independent authority to decide what to do. So we are not losing our sovereignty. In fact, we are only losing our sovereignty to the collective African nation in matters where, as we speak today, we don't have sovereignty. Can any African country defend itself if it's attacked militarily? Can it? No. Look at what happened in Libya. Look at what's happened in other countries. We can't. Now, are we in full control of our economies and our resources? We are not. So we are saying we will lose sovereignty to a bigger collective African body in matters where, as we speak, we don't have sovereignty. So truly, I don't know what we are going to lose. There's nothing to lose, but the, the chains of separatism, of 
uh, being different of the fear of changing a situation that must be changed because neither you and I drew it that this is the end of, of you know, Togo and the beginning of Benin. It's not you. This was decided by others. And for the explicit and implicit purpose of subjugating your economies to others, it's easier to control many little states whose economies, in many cases, not really viable. So have we reversed the true consequences of colonialism? Absolutely. We have not. So, um, well, one thing that occurs to me is one way to persuade our politicians to do better is this business of giving them wives across the place, you know? <laughs> That's st that story of, of how, uh, well, how, how you came about. It's fantastic, just two presidents swapping, uh, you know, wives and uh, they were on the same page. So, uh, on that note, um, uh, I hope you're now all beginning to think about uh, Pan-Africanism more than you did before. Can I just see, well, I'm gonna throw it open now for, for questions, so start getting your questions ready. But I also, first of all, wanna see a show of hands. Be honest, please. How many people actually have thought, apart from when you read Kabafest um, uh, program, I'm honest? A lot. <laughs> That's quite good, that's quite good. Okay, good. All right, okay, you can put your hands down now and then uh, we'll have some more hands to show who wants to uh, ask some questions. Um, we won't have time for very many because uh, we, we get value for money in the answers, so I think we'll take you know maybe two or three. Uh, gentleman there, who has the mic? Yeah, there you go. Uh, my question is very simple. I've been reading Leopold Senghor's Pan-Africanism, different from Negritude Movement, or are they the same thing? And secondly, how do we define an African? It's when we talk of those abroad, those who have lived in America for several years and they no longer consider themselves African. And also, we look at the whites in South Africa. Um, I think, um, so I think we'll take a question at a time. We will take one at a time, because we're not going to take very many. OK, so go for it. OK, yeah, very good question. Because uh, I, I can't speak much about negritude, I, I must admit. Hmm? Um, but um, Pan-Africanism, as we said, it's, some people define it as a movement. Some people de define it as an ideology or a concept, bringing all Africans together to unite. Mm? But um, having studied uh, a bit Kwame Nkrumah's ideas, I, I want to them and unity. It would be very limiting to reduce it to a racial alignment. Mm? And Especially that in our continent, we have so many races and colors. I mean, even in the same country, if you take a country like Egypt, the south is, we are black, and people think I'm a Nubian when I go to Egypt, because in Egypt, the Nubians are very, from very dark, from my color to very gray. And then in the north, because they mix with the, I don't know, Greek and uh, the Turks, and so they are very fair, you see? But so we cannot, it would be very difficult for us to start looking at everybody, are you d black enough to be an African or like, no, that cannot be a criteria. Moreover, moreover, uh, being an African very often, as you rightly pointed out, it's a state of mind because from time immemorial, we'd, we've had people of, from our very own who've sold us, you know, who've, um, who've um, uh, collaborated with our exploiters. So we cannot go by that. We, it is not a racial alignment. This is a political decision, political decision, and everybody who's on our continent, who's working for, the people of Africa must be considered an African. It's a choice you make. Hmm? 
good answer. Um, it, it's interesting what you, you say about Egypt and, and the Nubians. Did you know the only country, I like, as one mixed race person to another, the only country I've ever felt at home in uh, was Egypt. Because for the first time in my life, I went to a country where I actually looked like the people there. In Nigeria, I bear the name Shoyinka, but everyone is like, yeah, 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 but you know, why are you so light? And of course, in India, England, I'm a black guy. And those are my two countries. So anyway, I'll stay in touch with you. Egypt, uh, here I come. So uh, let me move over exactly. to this side. Uh, and let me also move a little bit to the back. I can see somebody, I'll come back to you. I can see somebody in a blue, actually that shirt looks almost Ghana design. It's a great opportunity, madam. My Pan-Africanism is synonymous a trend in Ghana. And can you trace any of those ideology in present-day leaders of Africans for continuity? Thank you. Yeah, you're right that Ghana somehow set the tone for Pan-Africanism immediately after our independence. And the trend continued somehow, uh, even if we pay lip service to it, but it, it, it set the tone. So, um, for example, this year in Ghana, we've declared it the year of return, you know, 400 years since the beginning of slavery. And we are, we are somehow campaigning uh, for Africans in the diaspora to come back home and not, not necessarily just come back, um, you know, uh, to live, but to come back and see the country uh, and think about what could be done together. So the tone was set. Uh, now, with, there is no doubt about it that with the exit of Kwame Nkrumah from the scene and some other staunch Pan-African leaders, Pan-Africanism has suffered. And we, 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 we cannot, we would be intellectually dishonest to, to, to deny that. Hmm? And uh, um, uh, that is why we are now gripped in this, uh, charters come from the AU and we have to, uh, it has to be ratified by I don't know how many countries and things are taking forever. What could have happened in 10 years, it's now 50, 60 years, and it's not happening. Um, and this is why we are saying we cannot leave this to our leaders. This is a people's choice. It's a people's mission. You know, that time has come for Africans to take up this call. You know, not, we, we can't simply leave it to leaders. So much has happened, and so many of our countries are grappling with, with so much. So many of our leaders are not even free to make certain economic decisions, you know, in the interest of our people. So the time has come for the people of Africa to, to stand out and stand up and, and do something, you know. That's why we are talking about these things, not in, in a, not in a political gathering. We are talking here amongst thinkers, you know, am among amongst um, activists of a different kind. So th I guess this is my invitation to you to, to somehow enter that arena. And uh, let me tell you that, you know, every uh, serious leader recognizes that there can be no meaningful change without the active participation of women. You know, I want to, I want to quote, um, again, <laughs> Kwame Nkrumah, but from one of his books, Revolutionary Path, I, I recommend it, and this is what he says. You can measure the degree of a country's revolutionary awareness by the political maturity of its women. So until the women are ready, to enter the arena, change, revolution is change, it's a great upheaval. So until our women are ready to enter the arena in full force, that major change won't happen. And if I think of the independence of Ghana, 
the way our women were part and parcel of it. And I'm not talking about well-educated women, too. I'm talking about women, everybody, traders, petty traders, you know, uh, students, uh, workers, but women across the board. When the f that 50 percent of the population stands up and joins the struggle, you will see change. W what's it looking like from your vantage point? Um, sorry, uh, please applaud for that because uh, uh, that's a, a really important point. No, it's uh, more important uh, to think about it than to uh, applaud. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let, let's let's see the the impact of your words. But it's on that point. Um, you're running this institute that's trying to revive, uh, revitalize uh, the Pan-Africanism. What, what is it looking like to you, including the participation and embracing of, of, of the concept, particularly by, by um, uh, active uh, activist women? What's it looking like from your point of view? Are you optimistic? Are you finding it a really uphill battle? You must be able to sample the temperature from yeah. where you are. No. Uh, we... Yeah, I think we still have a lot to do, um, and that is why I'm a feminist. I mean, but I, I grew up with, um, I have three brothers, I have a son, but I'm happy to say that my son the other day told me he's a feminist, and I thought, wow, yes, that's how, we sh that's how men and women should think, you know? We, 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 it, it, it's an uphill struggle, it is not easy, we know that, but that is that in itself is a reason for more women to fight on so i i we, we women have to be in every single arena mm. not just in politics but in everything uh, we have to um, we we have to understand that unless we are there full force so are we ready are african women ready <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, uh, next question, gentlemen in the front here. I'll come to you next. Good afternoon and thank you. Um, Good afternoon. During, during, your, during the earlier part of the interview, you mentioned something about um, developmental project, really meaningful developmental project. And I think one of the things we often miss out in talking about what seems like such a grand idea is the question of how does this matter to me now? In the middle of everything that I'm faced with, we just had a panel about poverty, we're talking about you know, everyday struggles. Why, why would I be concerned about what's happening in Congo? Why would I be concerned about what's happening in Egypt when there's so much that seems to be taking up my concern now? And I think the answer to that question is development. The fact that, and I don't think that that's stressed enough in our discussions about the idea of Pan-Africanism. The reason being that even when we don't, and especially because we don't recognize that, others who do continue to exploit that idea. So I'll, I'll give you an example. We, we've, we've heard about the idea of a transcontinental highway being built in Africa, connecting east to west, north to south, and you could literally move products from one end of the continent to another. That's not an African idea, it's a Chinese idea. And so while we're busy with our little struggles, they're looking at how could they produce stuff at one end of the continent and move it tariff-free to the other end of the continent, and we pay for it with no value to that same thing. So I guess there's less of a question and more of an insistence that we see this idea of Pan-Africanism as the only meaningful way for any idea of development that we're talking about. Absolutely, yes, because those big projects you spoke about will provide millions of jobs. I mean, the, you know, the, uh, in fact, the most important reason why we must unite, forget the fact that we didn't divide ourselves into borders and all, but the, the most important thing is for our economic survival our economic survival. Uh, because if we don't start producing what we consume, you know, if we st don't start cultivating much more land, we are going to be in trouble. Because our, in our continent, our population is growing, and 65% uh, um, of us 
are below the age of 25. So the average African is what? A young person. So, and young people need jobs, they need to have partners, have babies. I mean, they, 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 need, <laughs> they, need, they, they need to be able to take care of themselves. So for our very survival, we really need to consider how are we going to continue in this trend, being dependent on others, handouts, even like you said, for projects? No. No, I don't want to worry about my children and my children's children and their future. So we need to start uniting for our economic survival. Okay, uh, the young lady here, please, in the middle. Yeah, in black, yeah. Hi, it's been Hello. an honor listening to you. Uh, so my question is from the conversation you had, our problems are very similar in Africa. And one of the most similar everywhere is corruption and a great distrust for our leaders. So uh, if Pan-Africanism is a political union, who is going to take charge of this political union? It's still the leaders that we don't really trust. So how do you get the populace, we that, you know, we're supposed to, you're calling on to us, the populace, to push for pan-Africanism? How do we now push for a unity of these leaders we don't trust to lead us when we, you know, we can't believe in, I believe in pan-Africanism, I'm just saying, but how do you get majority of people to be on the same boat? with this problem? No, uh, so, yeah. <laughs> very good question, yes. But very good question, but that's just what we are saying. It's no longer about leaders. It's about us. As more, of, as more people enter active politics with a new, new way of thinking, because we need new politics. We need new women, and we need new politics. We need the politics of morality, the politics of sincerity. We definitely need a revolution in our politics, no doubt about it. Uh, and this is why some of us are pushing for more women to enter, because that would somehow, it will definitely change things a bit. You know, by all accounts, it is going to change matters a bit. We have to have new politics in our countries uh, so that things can change. Uh, you see, and I'm, I am, when, when you asked me yes, um, about you know, how do I feel, I feel very humbled to be associated with Kwame Nkrumah uh, because also of what I know about his selflessness in practicing politics. And I want to give, I want to narrate a story, mm? a true story. Um, I was born in a beautiful house on top of a little hill in Ghana, in, in Aburi, for my, my, my Ghanaian uh, uh, countrymen and women would recognize it. It's a beautiful place. Mother used to like it because the air is fr very fresh. It's a bit cooler. Now, the chiefs gave our father a piece of land, and he started building a house. And strong women supporters, women all, started contributing, telling him, yes, Kwame, we want you, when you retire or on holiday, to be with your family in this nice place, so we will help you build the house. The house was built. I was born. And then mother tells me, one day, father comes and says he's going to give this house to the state because the location is so good it will make a very good presidential lodge for dignitaries to come. Oh. Lo and behold, he gives this house to the state. And mother tells me there was a delegation of 20 strong women, furious, who came and said, and they told him, they didn't say Mr. President or anything, they, because they, were, they had you know, struggled together in, in the independence movement and all that. And they said, Kwame, you are a bad man. 
How dare you do this? You think you forced us to pay taxes to the state. Had we known you were going to give this house to the state, we would never have helped you. We wouldn't have put a password in it. We wanted you to have a house to retire for your family. And mother said, our father was laughing and he said, no, he has to explain to them why why he must do this. He said he has some of his own close um, right-hand people, ministers, who've they've been caught doing this or that. He's had to sack them. He's had to ask them to resign. So he has to lead by example and show that politicians need not become rich and amass wealth and have houses here and there and everything. So some people, some some leaders must sacrifice. Not everyone can do it, but some can. And they must do it and lead the way so that we start thinking about politics in a different way. You know, we need to have these leaders. And that, more than any other thing, that is what makes me feel very proud and humbled to be associated with Kwame Nkrumah. That he mm. didn't amass wealth, he didn't... He, he never he, he refused to have property. Maybe that's an extreme, but it just gives you an idea of what true leaders do. They set a path. And I think this is what we need today. We need selfless leaders in Africa. Yeah. Just to very true, and, and just to um, let you know that Aburi is a lot more famous in Nigeria than oh. you realize. Yeah, it, it's uh, especially for our generation. <laughs> uh, uh, during the Civil War, you know, it was okay. where um, some of the okay. So if you pass by, uh, if you see Pidwasi Lodge, think it, think about me. Yeah, it could it, have yeah. been my house, it, is it, but it it's could not. have been where you were born. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's it's a they beautiful have House. a tete-a-tete -tete amongst the yeah. uh, leaders of the uh, okay. combatants yeah oh, it played a big role in our civil war so we we have a phrase on aburi we stand you know the, okay. in nigerians hi history but anyway that's for another discussion um we're running um a little bit low on time i'm sorry because i have to uh, now um, abuse my position and ask another question but i think it's uh, important i think um for you haven't really um explained much about your your uh, what you're currently doing your organization that you run now and also how can we find out more about it where can we find you your twitter handle your website and all those kind of things tell us a bit about your the Kwame Nkrumah Pan-African Center and it's basically uh, basically set up to reintroduce Kwame Nkrumah's idea to the younger generation. So we are working on making his books and speeches available in podcasts, um, what do you call it, audio, and all that, because we really, really want young people to understand how we became independent as a nation or our different countries and why, and what, what we need to do. The message is as relevant then as it is now, until, you know, poverty is eradicated, and un until we have basic needs met in our continent, until we are productive, vibrant, economically vibrant nations, we cannot rest. We cannot rest. And some of us who are obsessed with, you know, political paths, we, we, we can't give up. So I'm also running again 2020 to re-enter parliament. Yeah, we, we cannot sit, we, we can't give up. We ha we, yes, we, we have to keep on trying. Uh, we have to um, uh, be part of decision making and we have to steer politics, as we are saying, in, in a new direction, uh, a new style, a new form, new direction. Uh, we have to do it. We, so, so that's, that's well, basically thank you. Thank the you. way forward. You, for you are a, a wonderful evangelist. And just so you can get a measure of how much you have managed to change people's minds today. Can we have an applause that reflects how much you're going to <laughs> embrace Pan-Africanism, please? Let me hear it for the keynote speaker. Thank you very much. So thank you so much for coming.
Uh, thank you to CabaFest for giving us this opportunity to explore this topic. I, for certain, I'm going to follow everything I can on Twitter. Yeah, I do, don't I? I just can't speak Arabic. So uh, please, um, it was the Kwame Nkrumah Pan-African Center. Kwame Nkrumah Pan-African Center. Please, let's educate ourselves. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Are you sure you are not related? We are both Egyptian. <laughs> uh, you are both Egyptian. <laughs>